morning. Pretty weak. Good morning. 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 That's much better. Thank you. I can tell you're awake, at least, uh, at least for now. Uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes during the class. All right. Um, we're going to pick up at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4. We pretty well finished chap, uh, verse 3 last week. If you remember, we talked about the work of faith, the labor of love, and the uh, steadfastness of hope. So we're going to begin in uh, verse 4, and we'll see how far we get today. Hopefully we finish chapter 1, but I'm not making any promises. <laughs> All right, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. Now, that statement in and of itself is rather remarkable. You think about the God who created the world. Uh, the God who is all-powerful, and all-knowing chose you, and he chose those who were the Thessalonican Christians. But then again, there was something good, there always has to come controversy, and in our world, the controversy is that there are some who teach that uh, God has chosen certain people uh, to be saved, there's nothing they can do to keep from being saved. There's nothing they can do to be lost. And others, there's nothing they can do to get in a right standing with God. It's all a matter of God's choice. Well, that's, that's totally uh, taking away from what the Scripture says uh, about choice. Now, this is one of those words where it... Uh, doesn't necessarily mean a lot to you or to me, but uh, let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. So we see at least here that the choosing has to do with faith, and it all also has to do with sanctification or setting apart, as uh, would be another meaning for the word sanctification. Now let's look now at, at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That sounds to me like that God wants everybody to be saved. And he's not limiting it to just a few, but he's opening, opening up that opportunity to everyone who meets his conditions of salvation. And then let's look at one more in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Just as he chose us, in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. So even there it tells us how the choosing was to take place. It was to be in him or in Christ. Therefore, anyone who is in Christ is in a saved condition, is saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so certainly it is not just that, uh, that he's been choosing someone uh, arbitrarily. Uh, he doesn't 
just select some people and say, hey, you're saved and you're lost and there's no hope for you. And we see here that there's the chance, the opportunity for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So that's, a, that's certainly an important thing for us to understand. We are chosen in Christ. Now, the next statement there, the grounds of the choice lie in Christ and his merits, not in our own merits or God's partiality. So Christ has done what is necessary. He came to earth. He died for our sins. He took our sins vicariously upon himself. And as a result of that, when we are in Christ, then we are the chosen, we are the elect, we are God's people. So the Thessalonican Christians were uh, saved in the same way as you and I are saved. They believed, they repented, they confessed, they were baptized into Christ, they were living godly lives. So that's how their choosing or their election took place. I don't know how good of an analogy this is, but uh, <clears throat> let's assume that we're in a, uh, sitting in a college class, and I'm the professor, and I hand out a syllabus that tells you what you need to do in order to pass the class. It's a pass-fail class. And if you meet the conditions of passing, you'll pass. If you don't, you will fail. It seems to me that simple explanation uh, goes along with what we're talking about here, the choice. We have a choice. Are we going to do what God said to do and be in a saved relationship with Jesus Christ, or are we going to fail? Who makes the choice? We do. You do. I do. It, it is not that God has chosen select individuals. He's chosen the ones that do His will to be saved. To me, that's a, a simple explanation because I'm simple-minded, and so it doesn't take a great genius to figure that one out, but I, I think it does get the point across uh, that we have uh, the opportunity, we have the blessing, in Jesus Christ, to have salvation. But we say yes or no. It's our choice. Is that clear or clear as mud? All right. hope it's clear. Okay. Uh, let's look now at verse 5. Uh, undoubtedly, I had another one. Yeah, uh, I've already gone over that one. Okay. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. So when he talks about the gospel, I'll get to, get to that in a moment, but he talks about it coming not only in word, it did come in word, but not in word only. Uh, the word that he spoke to those who were in Thessalonica has stated that it was Scripture. And so he was speaking Scripture to them. And that's what we need to be doing today as teachers, as ministers, uh, any kind of Christian sharing information with others about God and Jesus Christ. We need to do it from Scripture. Uh, one of the congregations where I served a number of years ago, there was a, a lady who was uh, served as our church librarian. She had not always been uh, a member of the church. In fact, she was fairly late in life before she was baptized into Christ. And I just uh, stopped her and asked her one day, I said, what, it, what one thing caused you to finally become a member of the body of Christ? And she said, well, at that time I had a preacher, 
and I could go up to him and ask him any question I wanted. He never answered just, well, I believe or I think. He would open his Bible and say, now what does this say right here? And that's all he'd do. And over a period of years, she became a member of the body of Christ. It was through the power of the Scripture, the Word, that she was baptized into Christ. So we see the Word was powerful. He uses the word power here. Uh, we're, we're thinking, or I'm thinking, that this probably included miracles, but we're not told that in the book of Acts. We're not told that really in the book of Thessalonians. But in other places, Paul talked about using his power of miracles in Romans chapter 15, verse 19, uh, as well as in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 4. Should have put that up there so if you wanted to write it down. Okay. Here, here's a word that I did want to get to. Uh, I find it rather fascinating to me. I, I, again, I have a simple mind. It doesn't take a lot to fascinate me. But uh, if you look at the word for gospel, it's pronounced euangelion. Uh, if you look at the A-G-G-E-L, in the transliteration of the Greek letters, it's A-G-G, -G, but it is pronounced angel. Okay, so an angel is what? An angel is a messenger, is it, is it not? He not, usually, and isn't that interesting where you see a lot of, well, I better not go too far with that one, You see, but you do see a lot of angels depicted in our day and time as women, but most of the angels were men, were they not? Or if not all, well, that are listed and were told about either. Uh, Michael, Gabriel, uh, so uh, I don't know what significance that has, but anyway, an angel is a messenger, and the reason I brought that to your attention, that word angel or angel is going to be used quite a few times by Paul, and in the book of Thessalonians, he's going to use it several times as well, so I just wanted you to be familiar with that. So the gospel or the good news is something that uh, is reflected in what we teach others. We should not ever let the good news become bad news. It should always be good news. And the good news that we're talking about we can learn from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, if you would like to. Well, let's just look at that. 1 Corinthians 15, an important passage for us, beginning in verse 1. I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if. Isn't it amazing how many times that conditional word is used? Uh, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So he, he describes what the gospel is. So what is the gospel? Three things there. Death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is. Now, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8. Actually, you need to start in verse 7, I guess. Uh, to give relief to, the, to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not, what? Obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. 
So the gospel, again, is what? Death, burial, resurrection. The gospel is to be obeyed. How do you obey the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus? This ought to be an easy one for you. Baptism. All right, what do we do? We die to our sins. We are buried in the watery grave of baptism. We are resurrected to a new life in Jesus Christ. That is the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. And we are, uh, we are becoming a part of that death and burial and resurrection when we're baptized into Christ. Any questions, comments? Our gospel, it shows the oneness. Yes. Of all of it. Okay. Yeah. It, it, earlier you talked about my, not our. Yeah, and, and that's interesting because you get back to uh, what Steve's been talking about on, on uh, Wednesday night. Uh, there are several things that are used here that our, where did I have that? It was our gospel uh, he uses in uh, Mark 1, no, he, the gospel of God he uses in Mark 1, verse 14, as well as this verse, and the gospel of Christ in Mark 1 and verse 1. So it's, it's called a number of things. Our gospel, I would think the emphasis there probably is the gospel that we preach to you, the inspired gospel. Paul is an inspired writer and also is an inspired speaker. He was talking about our gospel, but it can be used with other terminology as well. Okay. Let's the, the gospel has commands that must be obeyed, indicated by the fact that people must obey the gospel. And then we get into verse 5, our gospel. Paul's preaching in Thessalonica went forth to them in word and the spoken message. And the gospel also came to the Thessalonians in power. We've talked about that. It is very profitable that Paul demonstrate, probable, excuse me, I can't read my own writing, uh, that Paul demonstrated power by doing miracles in Thessalonica as he did elsewhere. Now, I think this is important. The conviction that we have inwardly will be exhibited outwardly by every word we say and every deed we do. You agree with that? We are, whether we speak a word to another person or not, we are a living example to others. We, our words must also be examples or lights shining in darkness. We are a people who has a power behind us, and that power is the Word of God itself. Uh, interestingly, I think I've got this next, or... Maybe two down. If I can get this thing to work. Whoops. Okay. Here we go. Uh, that's, that's where we were talking about a while ago. And then it was revealed to him by God. Uh, we know from our Christ, actually, at Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. I want you to see this too. The word power used often uh, in the New Testament is the word dunamis. It means uh, force. It usually has to do with miraculous strength or mir miraculous power. It is from the word from which we get our word dynamite. So every, every time you read the word, every time I read the word power, I think of this dynamic force. And that's the way that God's word is. If it's, if it's upon a heart that is searching for truth, looking for God's will, it is powerful. If it can change Saul into 
the man that he became after he persecuted Christians, if it can change him, I believe it can change anyone. Do you know <clears throat> do you know a person or people that at one time or another you said, there's no way that person will become a Christian? Which we should never say, but we may have said. I said that before to myself. And uh, you don't know all my history, but you'll be delighted to know that I went to high school in Mule Shoe, Texas. <laughs> yeah, I was a Mule Shoe Mule, okay, <laughs> on the football team. Yeah. Anyway, uh, after I had graduated college, I, I uh, uh, went back into preaching school for two years. And uh, my father preached for the Church of Christ there in Muleshoe for, I think it was about six years. And uh, <clears throat> they uh, called him back for a gospel meeting. And for some reason or another, I don't remember what it was, uh, but he couldn't go. And so he recommended that they invite me. And they did. I'd been preaching for several years. And uh, so when we went back there, that Becky went back there with me, and uh, which was amazing. She doesn't like to go into the uh, West Texas, the real West Texas, too much. But I uh, uh, went back there, and there were some guys sitting in the audience that I never thought would become Christians. And I was thinking, you know, they may be saying the same thing about me. I don't know. But there they were. And, and some of them were serving as deacons. And, so, and I, I was just delighted to think that these guys, what a change had taken place in, in their lives. Uh, go a little farther with that story. They called me a couple of years later and asked me to come preach for them. And I said, well, Becky, what do you think about going to Mule Shoe, Texas? And she said, well, you can go, but I'm not. <laughs> and we didn't. So anyway, uh, that's, a, that's a, another story for another time. Okay. It, 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 I didn't hear that, but maybe I shouldn't have. <laughs> All right. The Word of God can be powerful. It can change us. Yes, go ahead. Are people that say, you know, I've done such awful things that God can never, never forgive, forgive me. I cannot even imagine. And I always think about Paul. Right. Unless you're talking to someone who's murdered someone, there's nothing God can't forgive if right. your heart is where it needs to be. Exactly. So I, I think that that's extremely important for us to understand. And a lot of times people live with uh, unnecessary guilt uh, because they've asked God for forgiveness of their sins but they refuse to let it go and so that really doesn't believe in the power of God uh, God can forgive our sins, all sins and we need to understand that and, and not if we've asked God for forgiveness and, and most of the people that are struggling with this their lives are kind of at a standstill because they can't forgive themselves. Or they won't, let, let's put it that way, they won't forgive themselves. And, and yet, if God has forgiven you, you're forgiven. And you don't care, have to carry that weight of sin around with you anymore. Uh, it's a, I mean, Paul remembered that he was the chief of sinners, but he didn't dwell on that. He kept moving forward, and that's what all of us need to do and realize that uh, the power of God and forgiveness of sins. Okay, good point. Thank you. All right, and uh, oh, the word conviction there also has to be. It's a full conviction, he says. Uh, it is 
uh, assurance, uh, and there are some translations that probably say assurance. Uh, it is an entire confidence with the full conviction. Uh, so uh, he preached with full conviction. They believed with full conviction, and then they were able to uh, uh, endure persecution with full conviction, uh, which we could, we could spend a whole class talking about what's going on in Afghanistan. Uh, I, I don't know what all to believe, you know, all the stories that are coming out, but I, I did read one story, you probably did too, about uh, Afghans were checking everyone's phones. And if they had a Bible on their phone, they would kill them. Uh, that's persecution. I mean, there, there was also some stories, there were also some stories about uh, women and children being beheaded. Uh, and that has been the history of the Afghan, or at least Al-Qaeda in the past. Uh, I don't know what all is going on there, uh, but I know it's terrible. And I know that we have Americans there and American Christians there for whom we need to be praying. And uh, hopefully our government will find a way to get them out of there safely. Uh, but uh, we, in the meantime, we really need to be in earnest prayer for them. And I encourage you to do that. Okay, in verse 6. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you look at the word for imitators and look at the word I've underlined there, mime, okay? Uh, so you see how we get some of our English words from the Greek. Uh, they were followers, uh, imi uh, mimickers. Uh, you also became imitators of, of us. Paul said, uh, imitate me even as I imitate Christ. And that's the limit uh, of which we should imitate uh, those that we look up to uh, that are in the flesh. Uh, as they imitate Christ, we are to imitate them. Sometimes we put people up on a pedestal and uh, when they fall or if they fall, it's rather tragic uh, to our faith and maybe other people's faith as well. But uh, we are to um, mime. We are to uh, be the kind of people that Paul and those who were working with him were. Now, <clears throat> a couple other words I wanted to look at. Uh, well, there's a quality in Paul's life that inspired people to follow and to imitate him, even as there are people uh, that we seek to imitate too. There are, uh, there are great uh, gospel preachers uh, that sometimes we, we try to uh, mimic or imitate in one way or another. Uh, there are elders, there are deacons, there are great members of the body, there are great women uh, in the church that we seem to uh, try to imitate. Uh, but remember that we imitate them to the point where they imitate Christ, and we don't put them on a pedestal of perfection because no one besides our Lord Jesus Christ. Perfect. That's it. Okay, so if we put anybody on a pedestal, let's put him there. I, he uses the word tribulation here. Now, I, I thought that was an important word because it means anguish, intense pressure. Uh, you think about Christ. He lived in, in tribulation. You think about Paul. He lived in tribulation. You can read about that in the Corinthian letter about the shipwrecks that he went uh, through, the times he was beaten, and so forth. Uh, but he says that in much tribulation, well, Paul and Silas and Timothy underwent tribulation when they were in Thessalonica. But those who were 
Christians that were left in Thessalonica were undergoing tremendous tribulation as well. And Paul recognizes that. And notice, though, he kind of qualifies that intense pressure. He says, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, how can you have joy and be under intense affliction or persecution? Anybody want to tackle that one? Nobody wants to tackle that one, huh? Sometimes we equate the word joy with happiness. Joy is deeper than happiness. Happiness has to do with more of the external circumstances of life. What Paul is writing here is an inner joy. Notice, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Let's actually go verse 1 through 3. Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. So I ask the question, how do we do that in joy? By fixing our eyes on Jesus is how we do that. The author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Have you ever... Well, I'm sure you have. But you think about Jesus on that cross. Now, I never envisioned Jesus smiling. He may have, but I don't envision him that way. We know it was extremely painful to die a death on the cross. I see him in intense pain. But how did he have joy? He had joy because he was fulfilling the will of his father. He was doing exactly what his father wanted to do. And he knew through that act on the cross by giving himself up that large numbers of people even today can be saved. That's how he had joy. And I believe if we are doing the will of God, regardless of what situation we may find ourselves in, we can have the joy of the Lord. And we need to. So joy is is another word that uh, is an interesting word. It is uh, from the word kara or charis, actually, uh, which was, we've talked about before, it was grace. So when you look at, at that joy, we have grace in our hearts. We have a cheerfulness, a calm delight that we're doing God's will. Now, we don't always need to go around with frowns on our faces. You know, I, I uh, heard of one little kid one time that was in a grocery store, and, and uh, she, she and her mother were behind this guy. He was all dressed up in his coat and tie and so forth. And, and, uh, and the mother just whispered to the little girl, that, that, that's a preacher. And she said, well, I kind of guessed that because of the frown on his face. You know? 
we don't know, you know, I think as Christians we ought to be happy people, don't you? Uh, that doesn't mean that we always go around smiling when it hurts either. But I, I do think that we need to be a cheerful people because of what God has done for us. And we ought to exude that, that uh, joy to other people as well. Any comments? Boy, y'all are quiet tonight, today, tonight. See, I don't know if I'm coming or going, so, okay. So that you can become an example, uh, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. The word uh, example there is a word that means a die cast or an image, a, a statue. Uh, you became that example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. So there would be uh, believers that would be coming to Corinth. They would see Paul or, or uh, maybe even talk to him. And uh, they, would, they would say, uh, those Christians in Thessalonica are truly a great example for us. So even in bad times, even in really, really tough times, the Thessalonian Christians were examples. I can't think of a better time to be examples than during tough times. When we need to put our faith more and more in God, in Jesus Christ, and the Spirit, we can be examples to other people and should be. Okay, uh, Christians from all over Greece were looking to them as examples. And, and as I said, people coming to Corinth from Macedonia and Achaia would probably comment to Paul and to others that uh, those guys are just amazing what they're doing. Uh, if I was being persecuted like that, I don't know if I could withstand it. So they, there was good that came out of bad. Now, the Thessalonian Christians might not have thought so at the time, but they were being an example to others. I, if you can't tell, I'm trying. I, I, don't, I don't want to say I spent three weeks on chapter one. So, okay. The word of the Lord has sounded forth for you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. Uh, sounded forth. You can see the word more or less in their echo. Uh, to echo forth, to resound, to reverberate. Uh, the word of the Lord has gone forth because of what those Christians were doing. Uh, and he says, in every place, your faith toward God has gone forth. So they were, uh, they were talked about a lot. Uh, you might remember some of the uh, times around Texas and uh, even all the way to Tennessee, there were a number of tornadoes that occurred and a lot of churches were destroyed, uh, our, our brethren. Uh, had churches that were destroyed, and there were uh, brothers and sisters from all over the country, and it really from all over the world, that were helping to uh, uh, rebuild those churches so they, they could start over. Uh, so uh, the word in our day and time can go forth very quickly on the Internet, uh, phones, wherever it may be. Uh, where there is a need, there are certainly people who are willing uh, to rise up and help with that need, and so it should be. So in every place, he says, uh, probably referred to the provinces of countries near Macedonia, uh, but it could have occurred in other places as well as people were traveling to and fro. Uh, verse 9, for they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. 
I told you about the word angel before, didn't I? All right, there it is again. Uh, and it's, uh, you, at least in the New American Standard, it's translated as report here. Uh, announce, uh, declare. Uh, so we see again the word message is coming forth from this particular word that Paul is using. Okay, uh, the reception was, was an inference or a coming. And then, turn. That, I, th I found that to be an interesting word because, uh, again, I don't, I don't know a lot about the Greek language, but I'm told that it was in the aorist tense, a tense, which means it was something that occurred in the past and continued to the present. So, here he's saying, you turned to God. You turned once. You didn't go back. You kept on turning away from idols, and you turned to serve a living and true God. Wow. I, uh, I'm going to divert just a minute. I heard a lecture a number of years ago. It's been a long time ago. I still remember that sermon. I don't know how, because my memory's not too great. But I, I remember that uh, this minister was talking about uh, the idols in the, in the book of Isaiah, and I forget exactly what chapter it was, but uh, it talked about uh, how that they would take a piece of wood, you know, and they would cut the wood in half. And one part of the wood would be used for firewood, and the other part of the wood would become an idol. And he was, he was humorous in it. He's more humorous than me. But he said, what would happen if they got those mixed up? What if they happened to worship firewood and burn an idol? You know, and it was just, a, it was comical, but it was still so, it just lasted in my mind to think about that lesson, which I'd read before, but I really hadn't, put it in the way that he put it, but it, it is amazing to me that people can worship idols, dead idols, uh, and yet you compare that with our true and our living God, and it's no wonder that those who were in Thessalonica could uh, turn from worshiping idols to serving God. And certainly that was remarkable for them and also for others who were looking as well. Uh, the word serve there is a word that's often used in the New Testament, the word doulos to, to mean a slave, one who is enslaved to others. And remember that uh, Paul writes about in, in the book of Romans that we are slaves of Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people don't like that, uh, like that terminology, and so they come up with the word servants, which is still a good, good translation. But I think the word slave really gives us the concept. We are either a slave to sin or we are a slave to Christ. One of the two. We're a slave. And remember how those in, uh, Jesus was talking to said, well, uh, the Jews, he said, we've never been enslaved to anyone. Well, they were liars. They had been enslaved to a lot of people. Uh, and they were enslaved at that point in time to sin. So we are, if we are servants of Christ, we cannot be servants of sin at the same time. Okay, uh, let's move on to verse 10. I can at least say I got to verse 10. Uh, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Uh, wait, look forward to with patience and confidence. Uh, so again, there's more to it than just sitting there waiting impatiently, but it's waiting with patience and with confidence for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in that second coming. And he rescues us or delivers us. And the word wrath here 
is what word do you think we get from that? You can go go ahead. You can say it. Orgy. Okay, that's that's the word that we get from from that. Violent passion, abhorrence, indignation. That's the way it's going to be when Christ comes to those who have not put him on, to those who are not Christians, to those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's going to be wrath. We'll talk about that more when we get into uh, talking about the, the second coming of Christ. And then, the apostles always taught their converts to watch for Jesus' return. They were to watch for the return, but it amazes me how many people try to predict the time of Jesus' return. You know, you can rest assured that what time that they pick is not going to be it. Okay? So, I mean, he, how many people have been proven wrong over the years? Numerous people. Because we don't know when that's going to occur. Only the Father knows. Even Jesus doesn't know. So only the Father knows that. Uh, okay. Uh, the Lord says he'll come just when we think he's not coming. Okay, that's very true. And those who believe the Lord is coming again will be working to turn men to righteousness. Ooh, I've gone past time. Did the bell ring? Well, I didn't hear it. <laughs> Does that count? Okay. All right. I didn't hear it, really. Okay. Uh, we'll stop there, but let, let's pause for a word of prayer. Father, we are so thankful for this time that we've been able to come together and study your word. and we. Pray that we've drawn things from your word that will help us to become stronger Christians, help us to draw nearer to you. Father, we pray particularly for those Christians who are in Afghanistan, who are concerned about their lives and how they will get out of that country, and we pray that you will help to deliver them uh, from the evil that is there. We pray for ourselves and our fellow countrymen as our nation is in some dire trouble and we just pray that you will help us to become more of a nation that looks to you and wants to do your will it's in the name of jesus christ that we offer this prayer to you amen